Good morning, mathematicians. Welcome back to another week uh, with At Home with APS. This morning, we're going to start off a with a routine that we're going to use for the rest of our time together, um, which is a calendar. We're going to do a lot of different activities around a calendar. Um, it's a really good way to explore numbers and do some different things with numbers. So we're going to start off. I've filled out our calendar to get started because we're a little bit further along in our month. Um, does anybody know what month we're in right now? The name of the month is June. That's right. So we're in the month of June in the year 2020 or 2020. And today is a Monday. So we're going to end up filling in this box here. Um, the days of our week, I have them up here across the calendar or here. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Those are the seven days of the week, um, and you probably already know that. And then I filled out our calendar. We started June on a Monday. Um, and then you'll notice that there is a pattern also around my numbers. I want you to see if you could figure out what my pattern is, because when we get to the day we're filling in today, you're going to need to tell me what I should use a triangle or a circle. So I have green triangles and then two red circles, green triangle, red circle, red circle, green triangle, red circle, red circle, green triangle, red circle, red circle. Are you kind of seeing what my pattern is? Mm -hmm. All right, let's count to see what day we should put in for today, what today's date is. One, two, three, four, five, six, make sure you're counting with me, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. What's going to come here? What's next? 22. You're right. Let me get a marker out and I will write 22 on our calendar. And what am I going to put around that number? What do we have? If we look at this last Monday, I put a little asterisk on because this was when we started our classes together. And so this was a Monday, the 15th, last Monday. And we did triangle, circle, circle, triangle, circle, circle. So what should go here? That's right, a triangle. I'm going to put a green triangle around my 22. And when we're talking about the, the number of a date, it is a 22, but we, we call it the 22nd. So today is Monday, the 22nd of June, right? Today is Monday. So what was yesterday? That's the word that we use for the day before Monday, right? Or the day of our, our current today. Sunday was yesterday, Monday is today, and what will tomorrow be? That's the, the next day. Tomorrow will be Tuesday, you're right. The other thing that we have on our calendar here is, oh, I'm gonna need to get, Miss Carnage, can you come and sign in on your computer? We're gonna look at what our number um, is represented in with 10 frames. And so we have a full 10 frame and we looked at 10 frames last week. So everybody should recognize these by now. You may have used these during the school year in your classroom. So this is a full 10 frame because all the boxes are full. So that is 10 and this uh, is another one. So that makes 20. And then I had a 21 in there from Sunday. And now today is the 22nd. So now we need 22 dots. So count it with me. 10, 20, 21, 22. Right, okay. The other thing that we're going to do is something called today's number, and we'll be doing this each time. So today's number is 22. So I'm gonna write a 22. Oops. I think it gives me my pen. I'll write a 22. 
in the middle of our box. That's the number we're working with today. It's an interesting number because the digits are the same. Did you notice that? Isn't that interesting? A two and a two to make 22. And what we're gonna do is show different ways on here that we could represent 22. Can you think of any ways that we might be able to do that? I could write the word 22, right? 20. And you use a little dash or a hyphen before you put the two. So this says 22. What else could I do to represent it? Last week we read the book King's Commissioner. Do you remember that? What were they using in the book? to represent numbers. They were counting all the commissioners. Tally marks, that's right. And they counted by twos and they counted by fives with those tally marks. I'm gonna show you just a little bit of a different way that you could use tally marks. And this is probably pretty close to what you'll see. One, two, three, four. But instead of just putting another line like they did in the King's Commissioner and circling it, we're gonna cross our group of five. And then we know that each grouping like this is a five right away. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna make another one. Five. And then we'll check and see if I have enough yet for our number of today. So this is five, 10, 15, 20. Is that enough? Nope, I need two more, 21, 22. We could also count them by ones just to double check, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, Whoop. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that's another way we could represent 22. How else could we represent 22? We could do an equation, right? Were you thinking about an equation? I could make an equation that matches those tally marks. How many were in this group? Five. So five plus five plus five plus five and then plus two, right? equals, not that, doesn't equal a one, equals 22, right? How about the way that this is grouped to make our 22? Could we write a number sentence for that? What numbers would I use? This part's a 10, right? And another 10, so I could do 10 plus 10 plus two equals 22. One of the things we'll challenge you to do for homework after we have our lesson today is to think, see if you can come up with some other number sentences that equal 22. The last way that we're going to represent 22 is by what would be around it on the hundreds chart because we've been using the hundreds chart a lot also. So if I put 22, I think I might change my width of my pen. If I put 22 here, and we found that on the hundreds chart, we could think about what's around 22. Here's 22, what comes after 22? 23. What comes before 22? 21. And then if we go this way on the hundreds chart, we're counting by tens, right? So 22, 32 would be the next 10. And if I take a 10 away, I'd be jumping back to 12. And we could see that here on our hundreds chart. There it is, right? Okay, what are some other things we're going to do with our um, calendar? We're gonna have a counting jar. And so we're gonna count what's in our jar. So I would like you to count with me. One, two, Three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So there were twelve bears in our counting jar today. We write 12 with a one and a two. That was the number in the tens before our day, number of the day, right? So if there are 12 in the counting jar, if you are a kindergartner with us today, after we're done, I would like for you to make a collection of your own of 12 things. Maybe you could find 12 pennies or 12 pinto beans or something around your house. Your job is to make 12, a group of 12. If you are a first grader, your job is to double that. And you are going to make 24. So I'd like you to find 24 things and count them out. And if you're a second grader, you're going to count out 48 things. You're gonna double the first grade number. So we had 12 for kindergarten, we doubled it to 24 for first graders, and we doubled it again for second graders to 48. So you need to, after we're done today, make a collection that matches your number. Okay, what else are we going to do? We're gonna do a little counting from our number 22. So here's our number on the hundreds chart, and I'd like for you to count with me. From 22, let's go together. We'll just count by ones today. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. We went 10 numbers, look, because that was a jump down the hundreds chart. Let's pick another one. Let's try 42 and count by ones. 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. Nice counting. I think that's all the counting that we'll do today. We also have a book that we're gonna be working with during calendar math, and it is called Math for All Seasons by Greg Tang, and it's illustrated by Harry Briggs and published by Scholastic. And this book has puzzles on each page. So each day we'll do one puzzle and try to figure it out. Bright bulbs is what this poem or riddle is called. Canal, canals and bikes and windmills too, grassy fields and skies of blue. In Holland springs the time of year for pretty flowers far and near. How many tulips are in bloom? That's the question. A clever, a clever tack you must assume Mixing colors is the way to make a really smart bouquet. So he's trying to give us a clue. Mixing colors is the way for us to figure out how many flowers are in bloom. Well, let's look at the picture. We have orange, yellow, and red. But what happens when we look at mixing flowers? We have two, one, and another two. Two and two is four, and one more is five. So we have a five here. It kind of reminds me of our splat that we did last week, right? Where we were looking for groups. So we have five, 10, 15. How many tulips are in bloom? That's right, 15. All right, I think that's all the calendar math that we're going to be able to do today. Miss Carnes has an activity for you now. Um, and then we'll try again with some more tomorrow. Okay. Good morning, mathematicians. I'm so glad you're here with us. Um, a brand new week, and we have some brand new activities we've been doing with Mrs. Obenshane, and we're going to have a good time today. So the activity I have for you today, um, we're going to think about reading some numbers, numbers that are written down, and then we're going to think about where they might belong um, on a number line related to in relation to other numbers. So let's take a look at our number line. I'm going to move over here. The number line's behind me, and I'm going to move over to the right. So look at our number line here. What do you notice about it? It doesn't have all the numbers, does it? 
just has a few, just enough for us to sort of figure out where some other numbers might go. So what's the smallest number on our number line? That's right, it's a zero. It's way over here on the left side. So where our number line starts with zero, so we know where to begin. What's our largest number? That's right, all the way over to the right side, we have 100. 100 is the biggest number that we're showing on our number line. What number comes right in the middle? Can you tell? Take a look, think about it. You got it, 50. 50 is the number that comes right in the middle. And we have a few other numbers placed to help us when we start to sort numbers and put them on our number line. Do you see them? What are they? Very good, we have 20 and we also have 80. We're going to use these as landmark numbers to place other numbers on the number line. But first, we're gonna practice trying to identify or read some numbers, then we'll decide where they go. So I'm gonna show you just part of a number and you think about what number that might be. So, boys and girls, what do you notice about part of this number? The first thing I notice is it looks like it's going to be a two digit number a two-digit number. So that means we know this number is definitely larger than 10, right? It's 10 or larger because it's a two-digit number. I notice also that the first digit here sort of looks like it might just be a straight line. Hmm? So what number is a straight line? One is a number that's a straight line, right? So we know when we have a two-digit number that starts with one, it's one of those numbers we've spent quite a bit of time working on. That's right. It's a teen number. It's a tricky teen number. I'm going to show you just a little bit more of the number, and then we'll decide what it is and where it goes. Hmm. Our second digit has sort of a loopy at the top, and then it's going down into a straight line. Do you know this number? It's a nine. So let's take a look. Our two digits are one and nine, and this number is 19. Now it's time to place it on our number line. So we know that this number is larger than 10. Do you see any numbers on our number line, though, that could help us think about where it goes? What comes right after 19? 20, that's right. We worked on this last week when we played Crossing the Decade Concentration. 19, and then we go into a new family of 20. So I'm gonna place the 19 pretty close to the 20. We're not gonna fill the whole number line. So these won't be spaced out quite in the normal way. We don't have, we're not gonna have all the numbers. Let's take a look at another. Oh, okay, here we go. What do you notice? Another two digit number, right? So we know that this number is going to be somewhere on the right side of 20, right? When you're looking, it's gonna to be to the right. Hmm, do you notice anything similar between this number and the number we've already placed? I notice our little loop here and maybe coming down into a straight line. So that could be a nine. Do you think it's in the 90s? Let's look. A nine and a five, what number is that? That's right, 95. Where would 95 go on our number line? What number would it be closest to that you see? That's right, 95 is very close to 100. In fact, it's just five numbers away, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. Let's place it here near the 100. Okay, how about this number? Ooh, I see it starting a curve. What numbers go like that? Hmm, starting a curve. And does this one look like it has two digits? 
does not. Looks like a one-digit number. So which end of the number line would we place it on? Closer to zero or closer to 100? You're right, closer to zero. We know this number is less than 10 because it just has one digit. What do you think it could be? It's a six. So our six is going to be closer to zero than to 20, and it's less than 19. So we'll put it here. We'll do a few more, and then we're going to play a game on the Promethean board. Okay. Let's see. Oh, this is another two-digit number, isn't it? Sure is. I see kind of a loopy here. Some straight lines, but I think these are part of that second digit, right? Let's pull it down a little more and see what we see. Can you tell what number it is? I'm showing you almost the whole thing. What's the first digit? It's a three, right? A three and a four. What number is that? 34. So let's think about where should we place 34 on our number line? What number might it be closest to? Do you see some numbers that can help? Is 34 larger or smaller than 20? It's larger, isn't it? And how close is it to 50? We're gonna kind of put it right in between, right? Maybe a little closer to 20. And it's larger than 19, so we knew where to put it. Let's place one more. Maybe two. And we'll play our game. All right. Oh, another two-digit number. What do you notice about these? I notice they both start with a straight line and then going across horizontally, and then they kind of angle down. Looks like these two digits are the same. I wonder what they could be. Do you have an idea? If you said they're sevens, you were right. Our digits are seven and seven, so our number is 77. Where shall we place it? Hmm. 77 is larger than 50, but it's smaller than 80. Should it be closer to 50 or to 80? I think closer to 80. If we count it up, we'd see we're only three away. 77, 78, 79, 80. So we'll place this very close to 80. We're gonna do one last one for fun. And we'll have a little bit of time for a fun task. Okay. What's different about this number than any of the others we've looked at? Hmm. Looks like it has three digits. Every other number we've worked with has had one or two digits. So this is a large number, isn't it? I see a line going down. I see a curve that might continue in a circle shape and another line going down. So I'm guessing these are ones. What do you think's in the middle? A zero? I think you're right. So how do we read this number? This number is 101. Where does it go on our number line, boys and girls? That's right. It's the very next number after 100, isn't it? We count 100, 101. Let's put it just after 100. Terrific. We've placed all of our numbers 
And even though we don't have them all, we know we used our landmark numbers to help us decide where to put them. And we know that we've put them in order from smallest to largest. And if we filled in this number line, there would be lots of numbers in between, wouldn't there? So I think we've run out of time for our task that goes with this activity, but we'll continue with that tomorrow and we'll think a little bit more about ordering numbers with that task. All right, guess what? Good news, kiddos. We do have time to do a little bit of our task that went with our ordering numbers on the number line that we just completed. So this activity is called Fill the Stairs, and we're gonna do something really similar to what we just did. I'm gonna roll two zero through nine dice, or as you always know, you could use a spinner, but you can just draw on paper and fill in the numbers zero through nine. Um, we're gonna roll to get a two digit number, and we have to decide where to put it on the stairs. So, we're not gonna have all the numbers, just like on our number line activity, we didn't have all the numbers. So we have to think hard about where we're gonna place it. And we don't have landmark numbers to help us either. The big rule for this game is every number has to be larger than the number below it, and every number below has to be smaller than the numbers above it. That's the only rule. And if you can't use a number, you just write it on the bottom. The first person to, to fill their stairs wins, or if you're playing by yourself, then um, when you fill your stairs, you're done. So I rolled an eight and a zero. So, hmm, where should I put it? We have, uh, that's gonna give us an 80, right? Eight and zero. So closer to zero, closer to 100. Definitely closer to 100, right? So, Hmm, I'm going to put my 80 right here on my steps. Let's roll again to get another number. Oh, this time I got a five and a seven for 57. So 57, 50 is kind of right in the middle, right? Between zero and 100. So I'm gonna put my 57 close to the center of my stairs. I think I'll put it right here. Okay, two numbers on the stairs so far. Okay, boys and girls. This time I got a four and an eight for 48. So 48, where would it go? It's less than 57, right? So to follow the rules, I need to make sure I put it below 57. It's pretty close though. So I'm gonna leave myself, hmm, I think I'm gonna put it right below my 57 because I'm not sure if I'll roll any more 40s or 50s. Okay, let's try one more. A one and a three, 13. Where should that go? Compared to the numbers we have here, we're gonna wanna put that 13 a lot closer to zero, right? So I think I would put my 13 right here. Okay, so we would continue rolling until we could fill our stairs. And again, we know that if we're really counting numbers, there are many numbers in between, but we're still practicing thinking about which numbers are larger, which numbers are smaller, and where we should put them in relation to each other. Thanks guys for playing this game with me. Alrighty, now we're gonna read a book. So, got some things we're gonna use here with our book. This book, is called 10 Terrible Dinosaurs. It was written and illustrated by Paul Stickland and published by Puffin Books. The other thing that we're going to use while we're reading this story is this 10 frame. You remember that we talked about on our calendar what a 10 frame is and we looked at them last week. 10 frames have a row of five and another row of five and so there are 10 on a 10 frame. 
So before I get started reading you the story, I am going to set up some dinosaurs on this 10 frame. And based on the title of this book, 10 Terrible Dinosaurs, how many dinosaurs do you think I'm going to put on my 10 frame? That's right, I'm going to put 10 dinosaurs on my 10 frame. So let's get our dinosaurs out there. Do you guys remember these dinosaurs? Ms. Karnas counted with you guys with these dinosaurs last week in some of our problem solving. A couple more in here. All right, we've got 10 dinosaurs on our 10 frame. I'm also going to use this 10 frame to show you what it looks like since I can't stand the, the dinosaurs up. All right, let's read this story. We're ready. 10 terrible dinosaurs standing in a line. Soon began to push and shove until there were, what do you think? If I take one dinosaur off, how many are gonna be there? Let's see. Nine, I bet that's what you said. Nine enormous dinosaurs dancing. Their dancing was just great. But one was much too spiky. So then there were, oh, and I forgot to show you on this one too. So this is what our nine looked like, right? And then if I take another dinosaur off, what's it going to look like now? Like eight, exactly. Eight elated dinosaurs who thought they were in heaven, but one nearly popped. So then there were, hmm, we'll take one of these away and see what we have left. Nine, eight, seven. We have seven dinosaurs is what I think. What do you think? Seven silly dinosaurs playing goofy tricks. They look like they're having a good time. But one went too far. So then there were, hmm, if we take another one off. Let's see. Then there were how many? Six. Were you right? Yep. Six stomping dinosaurs who danced a crazy jive. But one got tangled up, so then there were, let's see if we take one more off. We've gotten rid of a whole row of dinosaurs on 10 frame. So now there's only five, exactly, right? We had 10 and then we had nine, eight, seven, six, five. Yep, five feisty dinosaurs stamping on the floor. Quiet down, cried someone's mom. And then there were, hmm, what do you think? Four, exactly. Four fearless dinosaurs swinging from a tree. But one got stuck. So then there were three. Three thundering dinosaurs who flapped and almost flew. One took off. So then there were, how many left? Looks like two to me. What do you think? Two testy dinosaurs, tired of all the fun, starting to get fussy with each other, I guess. One got taken home, so then there was, so this one got taken home, so then there was only what? One dinosaur, huh? One weary dinosaur who soon began to snore. His friend sneaked up behind him and suddenly yelled, Roar! I think they woke him up. What do you think? 
So we counted backwards on our 10 frame, right? That was what we were doing. We counted from 10. So count with me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We could also try counting backwards from 20. Let's see, we'll do it on our, our 10 frame, I think. So we had, this side has two frames. So there's 10 on there. Let's count forwards to 20 so we can think about how we would count it backwards. So that makes 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, oops, that one's stuck, 19, and 20, because I don't have two of these or 20 dinosaurs, so we'll have to do it with this. All right, so we have 20. Now we're gonna count backwards, just like we did from 10. So if I take one, we have 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. That's right. So counting backwards is a good thing for you to practice when you have a little time and we can come over here. We could also, we counted back from, from 10 with our book, right? Let's do it one more time. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We could count backwards from 20 like we did with our ten, double 10 frames. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. You could count backwards from 30 or 40 or any of these numbers. And counting backwards is very helpful for helping with subtraction. So it's a good thing for you to practice. The other thing that we're going to um, work on a little bit starting this week is putting in some vocabulary words. At the end of the week, we'll play a game with our vocabulary words. So I'm gonna add a few words that we talked about from last week. And then over this week, we will keep adding some words. We'll see if you remember these. And I think Ms. Carnes was using these words today also when she was talking about the numbers on the numbers line. So you did some activities with cubes and putting the cubes in order and talking about which were smallest and which were largest. And so that's what this vocabulary card is. This word is smallest. It's pointing at the single cube because that's the smallest of these towers here. And this word says largest and it is pointing at this tallest tower because it is the biggest or the tallest or largest. It has the most of the, of the towers. So smallest and largest are some good math words that we're going to be using as we're working together over the next couple of weeks. Um, another set of words that you talked about last week and I think we'll talk about again, and I was thinking we need to put digit up here also, which we'll add that one this week, but this is a two digit number and last week we used some arrow cards and we talked about what each of those digits meant. And what number is this? 36, that's right. And this digit tells us the tens in the number and this digit tells us the ones. And so we had arrow cards, we could pull them apart and you could see the 30 and the six. The six is the six ones of 36. So ones are over on this side and then this three represents the tens, 10, 20, 30. There's 30 under there, so there's tens. So that's what this one is talking about. Ones and tens are some math words that we're going to be working on. And then the last couple of words that we're going to put up today and review you used some coins at the end of last week in one of the problem solving activities. And there was quarters. It was on a grid that was large. It had 25 squares because quarters are worth 25 cents. I think you were trying to follow a path to see if you could spend a certain amount. Oh, it was the, jo 
the uh, coins in the jar. That's what it was. You were seeing how much you were pulling out of the jar. So a quarter is worth 25 cents. It's the biggest of the coins. A dime is, is probably the smallest of the coins, and it's worth 10 cents. The penny is the copper-colored coin, and it is worth one cent. And the nickel is a little bit smaller than a quarter, and it's worth five cents. So these are also some good math words for us to know. So as we're working through the next couple of weeks, we'll be adding some vocabulary words to our vocabulary word wall. And we will be then playing a game at the end of the week with those vocabulary words. So that will be fun. The last thing I'm gonna review today before Ms. Karnas comes out to play our game to wrap up is we were looking at some of these 10 frames and the patterns on the 10 frames. And so I'm gonna do the same thing with these 10 frames. I'm gonna show you the 10 frame really quick and you are gonna shout out what you think the answer is. How many dots are gonna be on this 10 frame? So this is a blank one, remember the 10 frame. All right, I'm gonna show you one real quick. Are you ready? Get your eyes ready at the TV. How many dots did you see? Did you say four? You were right. How did you know four? Do you see that one is missing from the row of five? That's a quick way for us to see four. One, two, three, four. Let's try another one. Are you ready? Whoops, what did you see? How many dots were missing? Can you think about that? If you said two, you were right. And what does that leave us with? That's an eight, five, six, seven, eight. We'll keep coming back and reviewing these 10 frames at, through some of the games also and in our calendar time for the rest of the week. But I think that's all the time we've got for it right now. I think Ms. Karnas is ready to play a game with us. Okay, so kiddos, before we play our game, we're gonna do just a little review because it is Monday, a new week, and sometimes we forget things over the weekend, don't we? <laughs> Kids and grown-ups both. Do you need me to play the game? I w yes, I will need you to play the game in just a moment. And the other thing I need is my blank five frame. So maybe you can help look for that while we review. Oh, there it is, perfect. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing now, but with our five frames. So what do we know about this frame? That's right, it has one, two, three, four, five squares, and we're going to look at some five frames with dots. Talk about how many dots and how many more to make five. Ready? How many dots did you see? Did you say two? You were right. And how many more to make five? Three more to make five, very good. All right, how about this one? How many dots? Five dots, right? Because the whole frame is full. There are no empty spaces. So how many more do we need then to make five? Seems easy, but sometimes it's a little tricky, that question. Zero, right? We don't need any more dots to make five. We already have five. Okay. Ready? How many dots did you see? Or you might think about how many boxes were empty. Right? One box empty means there must be four dots. Very good. Okay. Ready? How many dots? Three dots. And how many more to make five? How many were empty? Two. Three and two go together to make five. Last one. How many dots? One dot. If we only have one dot, how many more do we need to make five? Four more. Very good, kiddos. So we'll write down a few of our combinations just to help us out when we play the game. 
something else. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, we'll use our tree diagram. I'm gonna try to set this up so I don't run out of room. So what was one way to make five? Zero and five made five, right? It's another way. What if we started with one? One and four made five. What if we had two? It goes with two to make five. Hmm. If you're not sure, Mrs. Openchain is showing you a good way to think about it. Three goes with two to make five. We can always use our fingers to help because how many fingers do we have on one hand? Five. That's right. Okay. What's another way still? What if we started with three this time? Do you see one we've already written down that could help you? That's right. If two plus three makes five, then guess what? Three plus two also makes five. We just flip the numbers around. Okay. What if we start with four? How many more do we need for five? You might look at your fingers or you might use counting. Four, five. I just need one more. And here's that one again, that even though it seems so easy, sometimes is tricky. If we wanna make five and we have five, how many more do we need? That's right, zero. Five plus zero makes five. So we're gonna play a game called The Great Race for Make Five. Would you mind sticking that up here for us? while I get my computer ready. And I will get rid of our writing from before. Okay. And I thank Mrs. Ovenchain in advance for playing this game with me. So to play this game, you need either a special die that has zero through five on it, or yes, kiddos and helpers at home, a spinner that you can make on paper to play. So, we are going to roll our special die or spin our spinner. And depending on the number we get, we are going to make a mark on the row that goes with the number that goes with it to make five. And we're gonna find out which number wins this game. Maybe I can spin the spinner and you can Surely. roll the die. Let's see. Do we have a, Do we have a paper clip? Yeah, I'll just use this. Oh, that'll work. Okay. Okay, I get a one. So what goes with one to make five? You can look at our notes. You can use your mind and think about our frames. You can look at our blank frame to think about it. Or you've always got these, right? So what goes with one to make five? Four. So I'm going to put a mark on four. And four is one step closer to the center and one step closer to being the winner. Okay, I got a five with my little crazy spinner there. It's kind of better if you have a, a pencil and a paper clip mm -hmm. when, if you make a spinner at home and then you can just spin it around like that. So if I got five, that's that tricky one that Ms. Carnes was talking about, right? I don't need any, so I'm gonna mark zero. Okay, so far we've only got four and zero in the game. Let's see. But this time I rolled a four. So what can go with four to make five? If you look at my fingers, it's pretty easy to see, right? I need one more. So now one is in the game too. The race to make five. Let's see if I'll just two. Okay, two. I rolled a two or spun a two. So if I look up here on our chart, three goes with two. Wow, almost every number is going to be in. Mm -hmm. Nobody's 
moving ahead too much. Not yet. Oh, but someone's going to move ahead now because I rolled a one. So if I rolled a one, how many more do I need to make five? One plus four makes five, doesn't it? So four now is in the lead and getting closer to the finish in this race. Maybe I can use this, mic, this clip better. I got a three. Okay, so three and two. It's just the opposite of what I just rolled a minute ago. Two's in the game. <laughs> oh, here's a red one. Yes. Okay, Ms. Karnas rolled again a four. We rolled a four before. Can you think about what goes with four to make five without using your fingers? You got it, it's a one. One goes with four to make five. So one gets closer to the finish. And Mrs. Obenchain found a paper clip we can so spin. We can spin more like that. Oh, I got two again. So two goes with three to make five. So I'm going to mark off a three. Poor five. Five's not even in the race yet. Hmm. I rolled a one again. We are getting a lot of ones and fours. And they go together to make five, don't they? So one plus four gives us five. Four is awfully close to the finish. What do I have to spin in order to get one on the five? A zero, right? We'd have to be getting zero. I got zero. Look at that. that I just had to talk about it, I guess. I now guess everybody so. gets to participate, all the numbers. Yay. OK, everyone's in the game. Ah. Ms. Karnas got a two. So if I have two, what goes with two to make five? Can you picture two on our blank frame? How many would be empty? What would go with that two to make five? Did you picture three empty boxes? Then you were right. Two and three more makes five. Okay. I got another zero, so zero and five. So five's really moving now. <laughs> That's good. We wouldn't want five to be sad, would we? A one again. Okay, so I have one. How many more do I need for five? One plus four makes five. And we can think about fingers too, or we can think about our frames. Oh, goodness. I spun a two and two and three. Let's see if we can move this along and see if we can get one number to the middle before we're out of time mm -hmm. this morning. I think we will. And which number do you think it might be? Ooh, we have some that are close. I got a zero. So that's that tricky one. I have zero. How many more do I need to make five? five more, right? Because I don't have any. We'll try one last spin and then we'll have to wrap it up. I spun a four and so one goes with four. So none of our numbers are gonna make it in this morning, but you would keep playing the game, just spinning or rolling your die until one of the numbers made it to the center, and that would be our winning number. Mm -hmm. We definitely had four and three in the lead, right? So if we wanted four to win, what would we need to spin? A one. Okay. And if we wanted three to win, we'd need a two. All right, so um, just to remind you from our calendar today, um, if you were a kindergarten, you need to create a collection of 12 things. If you're a first grader, you need to collect 24. And if you're a second grader, 48 things. Find out and count out 48 things. You can continue to try to make some more equations that equal 22 and maybe play one of the games. We thank you for joining us at, today at Home with APS. Have a happy day.